Hello and welcome to the second in a series of films about standard level energetics. Um, in this particular film we're going to be looking at processes which are always endothermic or exothermic. So if you haven't watched the first film uh, where we introduced the meanings of these terms it would definitely be a good idea to go and watch that before you watch this one. But hopefully by the end of this film even if you can't remember all these different examples, at least you'll have seen them. It will be important to remember them eventually. And um, we'll review the idea of energy level diagrams and how we can show the enthalpy changes um, that are taking place in these processes using these diagrams. We'll also look at what we mean by energetic stability. Okay, so we'll start off with a couple of what are actually physical processes. And as with all the processes in this film, I'm going to get you to think about what whether these changes ought to be endothermic or exothermic before I put the energy level diagrams up. Okay, So if we're taking, for example, ice and melting it, we're turning it into water, most people would be very happy with the idea that we have to heat ice up. Okay, We have to put energy in. Okay, Now the ice is going to turn that heat into enthalpy. Okay, So its enthalpy should rise. Okay. So if energy is entering the system, this ought to be an endothermic process, and the enthalpy of the system ought to rise. So if I wrote on my energy level diagram here what the reactants were, in my particular example, we're starting off with solid water, we're turning it into liquid water, okay? and because we're having to put energy in, and the system is taking that heat and turning it into enthalpy, or chemical potential energy, its enthalpy is rising and the enthalpy change is positive. In other words, it's endothermic. And if I changed this to a liquid and this to a gas, again, we ought to be able to say, right, okay, well, in order to evaporate a liquid, we've got to put energy in. It will take that heat energy, turn it into enthalpy, so its enthalpy will rise. So melting and evaporating are both endothermic processes. Okay, And what we can see here, in terms of stability, just like the ball at the top of the hill is less stable than it is at the bottom of the hill, if something has a higher enthalpy than something else, we say it's less stable than that thing. So here, the water is less stable than the ice in energetic terms. Okay, Now we'll start looking at freezing and condensing. And these sometimes have the potential to confuse people. Because people think, well, if I'm going to freeze water, I have to make it colder. And things that get colder are endothermic. But we've just seen that melting is endothermic. So often it's easy to think of freezing as being the opposite of melting, and therefore it must be exothermic. As we saw on the previous energy level diagram, we saw that the liquid water had a higher enthalpy than the solid water. Right? So in other words, if you freeze water, its enthalpy is going to be falling. It's going to be losing enthalpy, and it's going to be converting that into heat, and the heat will escape from the system. Okay, So this is exothermic, because heat is escaping. Condensing, which is simply a gas turning back into a liquid, is also exothermic, because the gas is less stable in energetic terms than the liquid. It's got a higher enthalpy or more potential. Now if we look at breaking chemical bonds, now this is always true for any bonds. And if you think about it, if two atoms are attached together using a bond, then we'd have to put energy in to break that bond. If we're putting energy into something, then the process must be endothermic. Um, an example of a bond-breaking process, well, if I took a chlorine molecule, Cl2, and turned it into two chlorine atoms, so 2Cl, I'd have to put energy in to break this chlorine-chlorine bond, and I'd end up with single atoms, okay? Two of them for every molecule. And so the enthalpy change is positive, and breaking bonds is always endothermic. Similarly, if breaking bonds is endothermic, making bonds must be exothermic, it must release energy. Okay, So if I started off with, for example, uh, maybe two bromine atoms this time and turned them into a bromine molecule, I would be releasing enthalpy, Okay, or at least converting enthalpy into heat, which would then be released, and the enthalpy change would be negative. So making bonds is always exothermic. 
as I say, it's important to remember these, but if you can figure them out, that's better because you've got less memorizing to do when it comes to an exam. Now, ionization, we ought to remember something about ionization. We ought even be able to write um, equations for ionization. Okay. Ionization, remember, is when we remove an electron from a substance. Now, if an electron is attracted to an atom, then we're going to have to break that attraction to remove it. Okay. You might remember that ionization energies were always positive. Okay. And that's because the enthalpy change is always positive. We're having to put energy in because this is an endothermic reaction. Okay. So in this particular example that I've just been using, my sodium atoms might be here, and my products would be a sodium ion and an electron. So to take this electron away, I've got to put heat energy in, or might be some other form of energy, but I'm putting energy in, and the enthalpy is rising. Now then, combustion. Combustion is, um, I suppose, if you want to call it a fancy name, it's a fancy name for burning, and most people are fairly happy with the fact that burning reactions get hot, they release a lot of heat, and anything that releases heat, as we know, is exothermic. So um, if I imagined a combustion reaction, for example, that of methane with oxygen turning into uh, carbon dioxide and water, okay, then my reactants would be methane and oxygen, and my products would be CO2 and uh, two water molecules, just put two in here, okay, and because this releases a lot of heat, the enthalpy of the system must be falling, because that enthalpy must be being converted into heat, so combustion is always exothermic, and delta H will always be negative for combustion reactions. Now, neutralization, I suppose, until you do the acids and bases topic, you don't really know too much about what's going on in neutralization, but if I had told you that it's always an H plus ion, reacting with an OH minus ion to produce water, then hopefully what you can see happening here is that a bond is being made between H plus and OH minus. And you might remember from just a moment ago that if you're making bonds, you must be releasing heat. Okay, so neutralization is always an exothermic process. My reactants in neutralization process would simply be H plus and OH minus and my products will always be water. That can be said about all neutralization reactions. Okay, and if we're making a bond, then we're, the potential energy is falling, heat is being released, and the enthalpy change is negative. Okay, so that's all the kind of standard processes that you need to be aware of whether they're endothermic and exothermic. As I said, it's much better from the perspective of how much do I actually have to sit down and memorize, it's much better if you can figure out whether these changes will be endothermic or exothermic. Um, but either way, make sure you know them. Um, hopefully, you've also got some understanding of what energetic stability is now. So the higher the enthalpy of something is, the less stable we say it is. And you've had a reminder of how energy level diagrams work. As before, if there's any questions or any comments that you'd like to make, um, please feel free to come and see me, or even better, post a comment on the YouTube channel.